Welcome uh, to the Making the Future Speaker Series, brought to you by the Ryerson Leadership Lab and First Policy Response at Ryerson University. Uh, we're so glad that you're joining us um, uh, as students in the Making the Future class or the Special Topics and Social Ventures class, joining us on Facebook Live and or the other ways we connect with each other uh, in this 11th month of this experience. Uh, my name is Kareem Bardizi. I'm the uh, executive director of the Ryerson Leadership Lab and the instructor of the Making the Future class. And again, we're joined by a number of uh, students or former students in uh, Making the Future, as well as um, as well as um, uh, members of the public who have joined us on this on this Thursday evening to have a, a really in-depth conversation in 40 minutes. Uh, but sometimes these things go into overtime with three um, people um, that I've had the pleasure to work with or get to know who are on um, working at all levels uh, to make uh, our society in Southern Ontario and Ontario um, more just um, working on behalf of people who too often have been uh, ignored by the powers that be and working in uh, um, multiple spaces at once uh, on policy uh, in community, um, presenting truth to power using power and i'm so glad to welcome them here today um and so in order from my screen we've got joining us um adrian spafford from uh addictions and mental health ontario and sane dubé and A andrew buzari from uh, the university health network welcome to you both to all three of you rather so the way this is going to work um uh it's late night hours we've got a lot of students uh from a number of uh different places joining us as well as folks joining us on facebook live um we're going to be in conversation with adrian sane and andrew um i'm going to put some questions and then uh the students in the class have the privilege and the opportunity to ask ask some questions um we're going to ask some questions about policy around the situation with the pandemic as it relates to some long-standing issues um, but we're also going to hopefully um, long-standing issues uh, with respect to mental health, uh, addictions, homelessness, other forms of uh, poverty, other forms of uh, racism and prejudice that have um, really been playing out during this pandemic uh, and accentuated during this pandemic. But I also hope we're going to hear from Adrian Sane and Andrew as change makers, as people who have um, uh, kick at the darkness till it leads daylight, to quote, uh, to quote, uh, um, Bruce Coburn, and people who are, um, again, rallying their resources, their knowledge to, uh, to help make change. So thanks so much for joining us, uh, the three of you, after a long day. Um, I'm guessing it's at least hour 14 or 15 for most of you. So I uh, just want to share a word of appreciation and a word of appreciation for all of those who, um, by dint of all kinds of manner, are not able to participate in this conversation. Uh, it is being recorded. And we know that even the ability to participate in these conversations is a privilege that uh, we wish more we could we could afford to more people. Um, but we hope that this conversation um, serves as a space that inspires active action and activation uh, by our students and others in the space. So that's enough of a preamble from me. Um, so we've got uh, Adrian. Maybe I can start with you on, on this conversation and just talk to us just about the. Um, what brought you to the what brought you to your work uh, at Addictions and Mental Health Ontario, and um, what do you what is your work right uh, in the last year? What has your work been in the last year? Sure. Um, thanks so much for having me, uh, Kareem and class and everyone at the lab. And I'm really pleased to be on the panel with Andrew and Sene. Um, what brought me to my role at Amho? Uh, the most honest answer to that is that I was working for a government that lost an election and uh, I was looking for new work <laughs> and um, and I had uh, previously been in different healthcare foundations and associations and both in my life as well as over my time in my last role in government, which was as Premier Kathleen Wynne's health policy advisor, I really, there was a file that was no more important to me than uh, addiction and mental health and people who use drugs and really needing to completely overhaul the services, uh, the accessibility of services for people. 
And I've always been drawn to work that I am passionate about, where there feels like there's intangible, I don't know if that's oh, even a word, problems that really need to be solved and are really, really hard to solve. And um, I had so much respect for the members that I get to um, to represent in this role and ultimately the clients who use their services. So um, our organization is a pretty typical umbrella organization that represents over 200 frontline providers of support and services for people uh, living with mental health and addiction and substance use challenges across the full continuum. UHN is a member, uh, large hospitals are members, and, and then a lot of community-based organizations are members, primary health, sorry, like uh, family health teams and community health centers are members, harm reduction providers are members, and so it's, it's across the full continuum. In the last year, it's been, for the rest of us, COVID, 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 COVID. Uh, when COVID hit, a lot of our members, most of their frontline staff, I uh, didn't know what an N95 mask is, maybe didn't know that I, IPC stood for infection prevention and control. And so our immediate efforts at the beginning were um, trying to get them access to advice from clinicians and specialists so that they could continue to provide uh, safe care for their uh, clients who really needed it, as well as uh, for their staff. And then it's you know, been advocating to the government for good policy decisions around COVID-19 and also around mental health and addiction. And I'll end with this. You know, we, I say that we were a system in crisis before COVID-19. Uh, people were waiting for services for up to two and a half years uh, that were crisis services. Um, we had people dying at historic rates from an overdose crisis. And that that crisis has only gotten worse with COVID-19. So we've got to we've just had to redouble our efforts to build up the, the, the services people need. Thank you, Adrian. Um, it's a pretty um, sobering uh, set of um, uh, challenges. Um, and uh, we'll, we're going to come back to uh, how you tackle those challenges and how you find the hope in those challenges. Sane and Andrew, we've put you together as a uh, as a bit of a power duo, um, t talk to us about what, 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 what attracted you to the work that you're doing. And, uh, and you've got, a, you've got, um, you've created a, a, a job that didn't exist. It's always to my students, by the way, the best job is the job that you create. Uh, uh, and so Sane, talk, talk to us a bit about the job that you helped create for yourself and, um, and, uh, what your experience the last year has been like. And, and uh, just a reminder to the students, we, uh, Students did read uh, Sane's two pieces uh, for first policy response that you can definitely ask her more questions about. I don't know about this power duo, Kareem, but you know, <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> Hi, Adrian. Hi, Kareem. Hi, all you wonderful students. Thank you so much for having us today. Uh, and hi, Dr. B. Um, uh, it, it's great to be here um, and, and to be able to talk to you today. So I think in answering that question, I really have to go back to how I came to this work, to health work in general. Um, I have a brother who died of HIV-related uh, causes when he was uh, in his early 20s, um, and he died because he couldn't get medication. Um, and at the same time that he was dying, this was about 2000 and between, I think it was 2006, 2003. At the same time, in the global north, we were declaring HIV essentially a, a, a pandemic that we didn't have to worry about anymore because people could get access to medications that would ensure that they would live for decades. Yet in the global south, where I'm from, people were still dying um, and really without resources. Uh, and so that inequity really changed the way that I understood health, um, and it made me want to be involved in health work and to work um, in, in health policy, really, with the idea of creating worlds where uh, more of us are able to have the, the good health care. Um, and so I think uh, the work that uh, we do with Andrew, really, it, it understands that some of these policies I would say the work that we're doing at the social medicine team uh, is really understanding that policy is not abstract. The way that policy plays out is very real in people's lives. Um, and so good or bad policies, you can see the results of that in what happens with people's health um, and uh, uh, what changes over time. 
Uh, and so Andrew and I had done a bit of work uh, at the beginning of the pandemic around uh, the collection of race-based data. Um, and uh, fortunately, then we were able to really work on creating this role, uh, which was really great. Uh, a lot of my work focuses on uh, community and policy work. Uh, so really creating connections, a bridge between hospitals um, and then uh, organizations that are working in the community with the idea of uh, how can we change the way that healthcare happens in this province and in this city? Um, and how do we create systems that are more effective, that address uh, the needs that people have? Um, and it's it's really been great uh, working with Dr. B, uh, a great learning experience. Uh, and uh, he, he can talk a bit more to what the social medicine program is really, I think. Yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, Dr. B, the floor is yours um, yes. to pick up the, the, the baton. <laughs> Um, no, and, 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 you know, I'm just going to start by saying that, you know, Sane is so uh, generous in saying that, you know, in terms of learning from me, uh, it's, it, there's been so much learning from Sane so immediately, so much uh, wisdom and uh, really, you know, I, I don't know how we were even trying to do the work before uh, Sane was here. So it's been really amazing. Um, to have this team, to keep building a team, and Sane is such a central part of it and brings so much, as you can see, the authenticity and thoughtfulness, uh, but also um, just understanding, an understanding of how different spheres intersect that uh, you know really is not common uh, in the healthcare space. So we're really fortunate, I'm really grateful for that, to start from a place of gratitude um, and really grateful to be here tonight to be able to have this conversation, you know, with Adrian, Sane, Kareem, yourself, and obviously, you know, not just the next gen. I, and I hate when people say like next gen, right? It's like this is the current generation. This is it of students, right? I think you're seeing already people probably in your class as well. And with you, Kareem, are uh, change makers and are already making change. So really also looking forward to the discussion uh, and learning more about uh, so a lot of the work that's happening, both from the lab and from uh, these discussions. Um, you know, I think Sane has, has really pushed it so, you know, really uh, so powerfully about what we're trying to do uh, is an ambitious goal about trying to start to shift the culture of how healthcare is delivered with those that recognition of what goes into shaping health uh, has not always been uh, top of mind or part of practice in acute uh, hospital networks. There's been incredible leadership from community health centers and primary care and the community and social sectors over decades about how to do this work. Uh, and again, a lot of this is about the humility uh, to learn and try to see uh, these lessons be taken up in our healthcare system. And with UHN having a really large footprint as one of the largest uh, academic health science networks in the country, if not the largest. So you know, it's not a, a small task, but it's something, again, that we've been looking at how we do collectively with our partners, how we partner differently, uh, and how we start to see these things move into practice. Uh, and, you know, again, obviously, we can't ignore, you know, where we're at tonight in terms of the height of many crises, uh, housing, uh, the overdose crisis, uh, the COVID is still, at, you know, at its, at its height. There's some affecting regions in uh, the double digits still um, and, and continuing and obviously the concerns that we all have about the variant. So none of this work uh, is done. We're not out of the woods. And, you know, I think this is the time to be having uh, this kind of cross-sectoral conversations and partnerships uh, for us to get through this uh, more equitably. So you've each mentioned in some way the, the fact that the healthcare system seems to our conception of it is it works one, one way, but when we have that common conception, it's missing a whole bunch of things. I mean, I remember in, in, in Queens Park that the, the, it was said that the most important thing was just, you know, a patient and their doctor. And if we could have as many patients connected to as many doctors and things would sort themselves out. But what you're all saying is, it's actually a lot more complicated than that. It's a lot, a lot more complex. So what are the things that we're missing? What, what, what are the things, what are the things that are those like system, systematic uh, blinders or the things that are narrowing our vision? Uh, and what are the things you want us to know about the way we should be thinking about healthcare? Um, I think my first answer to that would be 
building up a healthcare system that is founded in principles around equity and anti-racism. But I'm not going to speak to that because I, um, I think there's one or two other people on the panel that are suited than me um, to do that. But I do think that's, that's number one. Um, and I think that's because just like other institutions, healthcare has been built up in a colonial history. And in my field of mental health and addiction, um, that has had very, very detrimental impacts. So in mental health and addiction, the um, behaviors people exhibit because of their illness are criminalized. And that means people are actually their first line of care for a lot of people, overwhelmingly black and indigenous and people of color for care is not health care, but the correction system or the court system. And so, so talking about the question, I would sort of flip the question about making sure people are having conversations with their family doctor or a nurse practitioner to who's not having a conversation with a family doctor or a nurse practitioner because that's really that's really where you need to start. Um, so I think the complexity in in mental health and addiction particularly uh, is in um, a history of criminalization of the actual behaviors and then it's in stigma. You know, and I think that we've come uh, and stigma harms people. You know, I think when we go through something like Bell Let's Talk Day, for instance, we think about like, let's back the stigma and that it's sort of this laudable goal, but it actually harms people. And that means that we don't have parity when it comes to access for mental health services like we do for physical services or for substance use or addiction services. So if I break my leg and go into um, a... Uh, an emergency department, or I break my hip, rather, this is a better example, and I go into an emergency department, there's like whole protocols that are based on evidence around what happens to your care and your wait times for services are measured and, and how your outcomes, um, uh, how you end up after care, that's, that's measured. Uh, no, no doctor in an emergency department doesn't know what to do if you come in with a broken hip. But if you come in in psychosis, um, there's, there's not... There's not standard protocol. There are protocols, but they're not followed <laughs> across the province. They're not being adopted across the province. And, and organizations, all organizations, whether they're a hospital or community, are not being funded adequately um, to be able to implement the protocols that would be high quality care. So um, that's how stigma hurts people. And, um, and then thirdly, um, and I'll end on this, that um, I think systematically what we have not done well enough at is co-designing services with people who use the services. And, um, and the, the, the impact of that is that if you, if you don't measure people's satisfaction with services, um, then you're really just measuring, a lot of times you're just, again, me measuring medical care and you miss the whole social dynamic of how people are interacting with their health care, which is so much more beyond the traditional yeah. medical system. And I think a lot more people in power, or at least through the media and through the pandemic, are starting to have some sort of at least sense of what some of those fact points might be around the other interactions with the system. Um, uh, Sane and Andrew would love to hear your thoughts your thoughts on that question about what are we missing when we only, what were we missing um, that was in, in plain sight for you, but not in plain sight for everyone else? Yeah, so I think I'll build on something that Adrian started saying that um, we don't all enter this healthcare system the same way. Uh, this healthcare system is a system that exists in a world that was built on colonization, a world that was built on slavery, a world where anti-indigeneity, anti-blackness, um, and racism um, is still really a, a critical part of how our world functions. Um, and, and I think that there's not enough conversation about what that actually looks like in real life. Um, and to illustrate that, I'm going to give an example that's out of Toronto, or Ontario, so looking at what's happening with the COVID pandemic right now. 
So every month we get this data uh, that uh, where, where it will tell us that uh, these are the communities that are the most impacted. We know that it's uh, largely racialized people. It's uh, folks who are working in low income jobs. These are the people who are really being harmed um, uh, by the pandemic disproportionately. And yet, when we look at the way that resources are being distributed um, in our province and in our cities, most of the resources are not going to these communities. And the truth of that is because our whole system is racist and our whole system protects resources and power for people who already have it. So there's no reason why when... Um, COVID rates were so high in racialized communities in Toronto that at one point most of the testing facilities in the city were in the downtown core, where there were really wealthy people who lived there who didn't need um, the same services. And that's just an example of the ways that our healthcare system really upholds the world that we live in. Um, and so if we want to create a different world, if we wanted to create a different way of accessing healthcare, we really have to start with that question what does it look like to dismantle these systems that are built to, to keep power for some and make sure that other people always remain on the margins um, and without the, the, the resources that they need? So I think oh, you have to ask the right questions, and we don't ask the right questions. Thank uh, you, that, Sunny. That's, that's the big issue. Yeah, sorry. I'll talk. No, no, that's great. That's a great intervention. Andrew, do you want to pick up on one of those points? I know you have a speci you, you've written specifically on access to testing as being a, a, an issue that's been unevenly distributed. Look, I just, you know, kudos to uh, Adrian and Sane on calling out the colonial structures, right? Again, I completely agree that it's not been um, recognized and um, put forward enough and not enough has been done to be uh, anti-colonial, anti-racist in our healthcare system. Um, it was just seemingly enough to be neutral and blind uh, or willfully ignorant but as Sane has, you know, so, you know, perfectly put, those same inequities have been entrenched, and we've seen that play out where we know the resources haven't been shifted or redistributed uh, rightfully uh, as they should have been during this pandemic through both waves, right? So we've seen this play out twice, and we heard a lot of uproar after the first wave. How could this be? And in the second wave, it's the exact same thing. So not needing, you know, much long or length of time to say that we've had, you know, a loss of memory on this. I think it's all been top of mind, there's just been systemic discrimination not to act. I do think the one piece, and I, I would just have to comment as, you know, because uh, I'm sure, you know, um, you know, not to be uh, too anti-physician as a physician, but I do think of the, you know, of recognizing of the medical establishment, um, you know, I think these, some of these aspects from even the colonial structures and, and, and authors of, and designers of our system, did recognize and did call out that a Medicare system or a hospital-based system alone was not going to be sufficient to improve health outcomes more generally. And you, you know, if you go back into history and go through the reports, I mean, you start at 1974 with this, you know, Senator with the, the Minister Lalonde report at the time was Minister of Health and Social Welfare. So even in the 70s, we had a better appreciation that health and social care had more of a connection where we, we don't see that now in 2021. And, and all to say that that recognition in the report was saying, you know, less than 10 years after passing uh, Medicare, as we know it now, in terms of getting access to hospital-based services and physicians and doctors and nurses, um, had said that, you know, if we don't actually invest in where people sleep, eat, the air they breathe, the environment, uh, our own uh, social determinants of health, as has come to be, and the structural determinants of health, we will continue to see these inequities and will not see major gains in population health. And so I thought that was very prescient by Mr. Lalonde. And I would say the, you know, the, the really maddening part about this is we were ahead of our other OECD peers in recognizing the social determinants of health. Uh, the Black Report came out in 1980 in the UK. Lalonde was in 74. The US is still reckoning with the social determinants and obviously seeing some other European countries, they've moved ahead of us on acting on it. And I think that's been the part that's really tough in Canada. I think we've had complacency in saying, we have a universal healthcare system, look how terrible it is in the US uh, and let's continue to be willfully ignorant about the inequities that, that Sane and Adrian uh, have laid out. Thank you, Andrew. I'm just gonna to pause to point out to, my to the students uh, a learning I'm getting from this conversation, which is the lens 
just listen to the lens and that there's a fundamental analysis and it's overlapping, it's shared in some cases, not entirely in other cases that Adrian Sané and Andrew bring to this work. Adrian looking at the system as a whole and making this obvious, pointing out this obvious contradiction between one kind of uh, care and another. Sané pointing out in a, in a couple of different uh, examples, uh, the, the, the biases, whether it's related to the tragic uh, passing of her brother. Um, I mean, let's just pause on, if you don't mind, like this is this is this conversation. These conversations that we have in this class, and the conversation that you're talking about, and that you the three of you witness every day, are life and death conversations. These are the most fundamental issues that we can touch on, and to have that knowledge that there are systematic things that are happening, that are being chosen or ignored, that are perpetuating that is a really important analysis. And, and then uh, to hear, and then uh, uh, Dr. Buzari's analysis that brings in all these other social policy issues. Um, and just note how he, he, he spoke about these reports and each of these um, uh, um, uh, leaders that we have in front of us today have this depth of knowledge from a, a time in the sector, a time that maps personal experience to system change. And I just want to make sure that you guys are seeing, you all are seeing that. Um, uh, Andrew, we assigned your Twitter feed to the students. So they, they heard you on paid sick days. They heard you on uh, Sane, they heard you on on on, on uh, the racism in the system. Um, Adrian, they heard uh, uh, they heard some of the um, some of your um, sense of that, illustrating that contradiction. These are really important lenses and ways of doing this work, uh, and it takes depth of knowledge and it takes depth of experience, um, and that you've each brought different kinds of experiences, different kinds. You're not just the practitioners; you're bringing different things to the table, and I think we really appreciate that. I have some student questions now, if you don't mind. Uh, Johanna asks, um, with the BIPOC uh, Black Indigenous person of color community being largely impacted by COVID-19, are Black Indigenous pe people of color represented in the decision-making process to influence policies that will directly impact their communities? So this is now a very specific question about are, are BIPOC people, and there are different ways people refer to these different overlapping communities, are they at the table? Are they having a voice? Are they having influence? And which tables? I feel I, I, feel I must start it. <laughs> so I hope you can see my, my smile here because I think it's, in some ways, yes. And in some ways, no. In some ways, we're still having the same conversations that we've been having um, for a long time. So I think that uh, a good thing that we've seen over the course of this year um, is COVID happening at the same time that we've had a real reckoning around uh, racial injustice uh, in this country and really in this part of the world globally. Um, and what that has done is it, it, it's created space uh, for, for some folks to really, leaders who have been doing this work for a long time, uh, to, for their work to be visible and for them to have some levers that levers that they can shift um, in moving things forward. So I think we do have some some people at the table um, in really important ways, but it's still lacking. Um, I think that even when you look at all of the tables we have in Ontario, from the the COVID science tables to um, many of the ones that are working on data. Uh, I would argue that we don't have enough of those people sitting um, at those tables. Uh, yeah, that's a quick answer. So yeah, and you both sit at these tables. You all three of you sit at these tables. Um, what kind of how? And you don't have to tell us exactly what they are, but take us on inside the room. What's it like to um, represent, but feel like why am I the person representing this position? Um, do you have some, do you have to sometimes make some deals to keep your be, be, be a bit more quiet than you would prefer to otherwise, or do you feel you can be uh, just as expressive as you would be um, in any situation and still get the results you need for the people you, that you're working on behalf of? Adrian represents an association. You must deal with this daily. Yeah, this has actually been a very live uh, issue in my life <laughs> just over the last week, actually, because um, over the last two weeks, people have referred to me repeatedly. Like it's just been this scene the last two weeks where people call me an advocate as though it's a bad thing. 
Um, I am the CEO of an association. Ultimately, it's the, the members who pay their dues who are the service providers, but I'm mandated by the board to really have a focus on the clients ultimately and on the, and on the people and also on people who aren't getting access to the services because we've got access and equity and racist problems in our own services. Um, but, and, and just my last actually formal work call, my formal work, my last formal work meeting was at the, uh, the mental health and addiction provincial COVID response table. And we were reviewing a graph of um, opioid deaths since the pandemic and the number, the, it's, like a very steep increase. So data is about to come out from the provincial coroner that's going to show that the numbers actually increased. Like it, we already knew over the course of the pandemic um, that deaths had increased between 35 to 40 percent and that's gone up since the last time it was reported on. And I've now been asking, for instance, We've got no, uh, you'll, Kareem knows this, I, I intend to go to specifics, but for instance, in Toronto, there's currently no residential withdrawal management or detox beds for women. And that's been the case since the beginning of the pandemic. So we had a member, Jean Tweed, who was looking, who had a woman who was living with, who, who was in a precarious housing situation because she's a sex worker and um, her sex, the person who sex traffics her, uh, she lives with him and he's part of the uh, substance use issue. And so she needed a bed to detox. She couldn't detox safely at home. And there's no, there's no beds in Toronto. And so she, um, she ended up overdosing um, while she was looking for a, a bed and she survived, thankfully. Anyways, I've been hearing stories and stories and stories like this. And to go back more directly to your question, so I'm taking so much time, Kareem. I find it's a very, it's a hard balance, right? Because you care about the work. Obviously, you can tell I'm passionate about my work. I care about the fact that it is life or death for people, and yet you're dealing with um, you're ultimately there as a professional, and you've ultimately got an organization to run. And so some days I can be a lot more objective and. Some days I have a really hard time um, not getting a lot um, more sort of stringent about the fact that we need to act because back to this example, if investments could be made to open back up those beds, which are just capital investments to be able to make the facility more clean and able to be in adherence to infection prevention and control requirements in a COVID-19 environment, we could open back up those beds. And I've been saying that for a year and it's not happening and the numbers keep going up. So it's a balance. Maybe I'll open up to, to anyone for this next question, which is informed by, by some of the questions we're coming that are coming in right now. Um, so there's a lot of things that, and students have been asking this in the class since this class started, what's, what's stopping the obvious things from happening? Sani, you referred to the racism um, and the colonialism. Um, Andrew, you referred to lessons that we had learned, we thought intellectually 40 or 50 years ago that we're not applying. Is there something that's happening? And I want to end on some hope. So we'll, we'll get to the hope question. But what is, what is the, could you, could you give us a sense of some of the, maybe play, let's pick a, a particular situation uh, around, let's say long-term care, which is not, which, which I think suffers from some of the some of the systemic challenges you've referred to, but also has its own systemic challenges. The students were asking before the before the break, why was this? We this is a replay of what we already happened. Why? So can you can you talk to us just about how systems respond or don't respond um, to things that are intellectually obvious or apparently obvious? You know, it's good. You know, you offer it to your panelists, and then you forget the question. I'm just joking. It's a great question. Um, no, I think that. Um, well, one, I just wanted to, to just uh, give our support and solidarity to Adrian. It's not an easy position. It's unimaginable to be the head of an association and then be told uh, being an advocate is like a dirty word. So, you know, while we're here in this space, in the safe space of where, you know, people are able to talk about what they're doing and, and reflecting on leadership in real time, uh, lots of 
uh, you know, love and respect to Adrian for what she's, you know, taking on on the daily uh, in terms of advocating with the data as well as having to keep uh, stakeholders and constituents and partners uh, happy, which I'm sure is always a, a really easy exercise, Adrian. Um, yeah, and I think on just one piece, I think, you know, Sonia and I have had this conversation a little bit, uh, quite a lot actually throughout the pandemic. I mean, I think you just reach a point in the pandemic when you make a personal decision about what you're willing to sacrifice uh, in keeping commitment to whatever your truth is. And I think it's a diff different stage for a lot of us. Um, maybe, you know, and I'm speaking for my own colleagues in medicine, sometimes it may never happen. You feel that there's too many confines in the profession wants to stay stuck on neutrality. Um, but I think for a lot of us, many of us in healthcare through the pandemic, uh, we sort of have stepped into those moments of, of truth. And so I think Kareem, though, to your question about why, you know, we're not seeing the system change that, that we've either seen through the first wave, let alone 40 to 50 years ago, all I have to do is look back a few months, in some cases, a few weeks um, to see what wasn't working and what could easily happen. I mean, I think, Part of it with healthcare that we're dealing with is a highly fragmented system. Um, and now asking a system to respond, you know, in an IMS emergency structure to things where it's been designed to essentially not speak to each other. Like it still baffles me that we have, and, and Adrian, you may disagree, but we've got a minister of mental health, a ministry of long-term care, and a ministry of health, and we're dealing with COVID, you know, and that's, and I've seen it, everyone's seen it of uh, publicly, the, each ministry shirk a question about why isn't this happening long-term care? Oh, it's a issue of health. I'm sure when Adrian is advocating rightfully for change, they're saying it's a ministry of health issue versus a ministry of mental health issue. Uh, and I can understand ostensibly why some of those decisions were made to give credence and focus to issues that were really deserving like long-term care. Uh, like mental health, but it can sometimes have unintended effects in setting it back and seeing fragmentation and seeing it be uh, sidelined. And I think, again, where there was maybe a hope to see these areas shored up, which were not chronically neglected in our system, especially mental health and addictions, um, the pandemic happened and has not allowed that kind of crosstalk to happen. Uh, I think there's a lot of vested interests and issues as well to try to be protectionist about your ministry, about your funding, about your responsibilities that are playing out in real time. Uh, and then as, as Sana said, within the backdrop of systemic discrimination is that, you know, you're also hearing more loudly from certain uh, constituents and lobbies and groups uh, than you are from others. And I think, again, it may also make people in my own profession uncomfortable. Uh, the OMA, the Ontario Medical Association, was the largest political campaign spender in the previous election. I mean, it spent every other association under the table, pound for pound. I mean, I think we all remember uh, some of the ads about not being an advocate. Uh, and now all we're asking for the OMA and the OMA had to be and has to be in a pandemic is an advocate. Uh, and we're not seeing those same spends. It's 2021 and people are dying, whether it's the overdose crisis, uh, whether it's the COVID, but because it's not 2022 and it's not an election year, we're not seeing millions of dollars go into advertising and things that we know have to be out there on vaccine hesitancy, on issues of system reform, of having to ensure that governments are being held accountable. So, you know, I think those are my reflections on why, why we're not seeing the kind of response that we've seen before. And I hope we see those system changes, you know, within the next, the next stretch. Making the future students, and Dr. Bazzari has just laid out the assignments too for you, the uh, engage in authority. He's just told you the, the an authority that um, was prominent um, a couple of years ago with its public messaging and has gone surprisingly silent, um, creating space incidentally for people like Dr. Bazzari and other prominent physicians to, to gain a voice uh, or to amplify their voices while the association has been a bit more silent. So that's a really important uh, observation. And again, making the future students uh, take that and run with it. Um, I want to ask, and there's some some questions, uh, various kinds of questions from students around what can we do, what can you, what have you done, and so maybe just from your perspective, what what's the most constructive thing that you've been able to push uh, during the pandemic? Um, uh, and then we'll maybe uh, conclude with that, the question from uh, Hamza that's just been put in the. So what's what's the what's the one thing that you've like? Yeah, this was hard work. 
Um, but we, I, I've moved the ball a little bit. I've moved, we, we've gotten some results for some people. Um, not everything I wanted, but it, it, um, but it, but we've helped some people with this thing that I've done or that, uh, that my institutions helped do. Cause I know you're modest. You wouldn't take credit for any of these things yourselves and, or a bigger cause you've been right. part of that you've, that you've helped move along a bit since the pen during the pandemic. Yeah, a few things. I think um, at Social Medicine, a partnership we are really um, proud of and have learned a lot from and that continues to inform our work is work that's happening with the COVID isolation hotel uh, where uh, folks who are experiencing homelessness um, are able to isolate um, while they're waiting for COVID results. Um, and it's a really unique model where we've been able to provide care for folks that's COVID-related and non-COVID-related we have a supervised consumption site on site at that at that um, that that hotel. We have seen the benefits of having uh, different types of healthcare workers, uh, so nurses, docs, and then also peer workers and community workers, harm reduction um, as really uh, uh, critical parts of the program. So I think that what's beautiful about that um, that program and that 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 initiative is that it shows us what healthcare could look like. Um, and what it looks like when we build around people who face the highest barriers um, and respond to all of their health care needs, um, and then what, what that enables them to do uh, and the ways that it enables them to be able to exist in the world. Um, so I think that that's a program we're proud of and would like to see more. Uh, and where, where is that hotel, Sene? So it's, it's one of the uh, isolation hotels in Toronto. So every uh, there's a few isolation yeah. hotels. Um, in 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 Ontario, um, and this is the Toronto one. The we Toronto. don't really reveal the location right. publicly because stigma. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you, uh, Andrew, and then Adrian. And we're going into overtime here. I appreciate people's ongoing attention. Yeah, for for the time, I would fully agree with Sane and and let Adrian have a okay. chance to talk about her organization. Okay. Um, the the thing that I'm proudest of for our organization over the course of the pandemic is actually related to um, focusing on equity, anti-racism and inclusion. Um, you know, during the summer, many of us as leaders were called to um, make comments in support of Black Lives Matter and the Black Lives Matter movement. And in particular in Toronto, there were a number of deaths that were connected between race and mental illness and that started a whole much needed conversation about a crisis response to mental health and we identified at our organization that within i i represent organizations that per, serve specific racialized communities but i also represent mainstream mental health and addiction organizations and we identified that without pausing in the middle of a pandemic and refocusing our efforts around anti-racism and equity, that uh, we wouldn't have a good solution to a crisis response outside of police. And that we needed to do that by um, building up relationships with communities and services that are safe for communities. And so, We've uh, we reprioritized um, anti-racism, anti-black racism, anti-indigenous racism, and equity was sorely missing from the strategic plan that we just released. And so we are working on revisions to our strategic plan and we've prioritized um, funding to be allocated towards um, an anti-black and anti-indigenous, anti-racism, equity and inclusion strategy. Um, that will develop two frameworks, one to build up um, anti-racist organizations. So that's 200 members that will be committed to that and then um, actually improve services for uh, black people, indigenous people and people of color. Thank you, Adrian. Um, and I think the, all the three of you and your organizations have really been central to elevating these questions that were too often on the margins. They're not yet at the table all the time. They're not yet uh, at the bedside. They're not yet being talked about in enough families, enough quarters of power. But, um, but I detect uh, some progress, uh, at least in the rhetoric. 
Um, and then what are the actions that are supporting that rhetoric? And to conclude on actions, I've got a couple of students, um, um, uh, Hamza and Kasaya are asking in different ways, how do we engage organizations? How do black and indigenous people uh, arm themselves while navigating the systems that don't prioritize them? So how, more downstream, if we're not, if we're not the pr professionals, but we wanna start engaging on these issues and or advocating for ourselves in these systems, um, I'm trying to mix two questions here at once. I know it's uh, uh, imperfect. Um, what, 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 do you, what do you say to us about um, building power either within the healthcare system um, as, as, as navigators, patients, um, or, um, or building power politically and policy-wise if we're not the experts? Yeah, this question like this, um, do sometimes make me nervous because of uh, the idea that just having Black folks in spaces or Indigenous folks in, in leadership will ultimately lead to um, uh, uh, changes that really uh, can move things forward. So I think that uh, we, we, we survive these institutions by doing the work that we need to do in them. Um, and I think about someone like Toni Morrison who had that quote, that your job, um, once you are in these places, is to open the door and to bring other people with you. Um, and I think that uh, for Black folks, Indigenous folks, no matter where you, I, 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 I don't want to be prescriptive, but I just when you are in these places, really the role um, is to open up, um, do the work, and then open up spaces so that uh, other people are coming behind you um, and that the world you are creating is a better one after that. So I would say that as a black woman um, who's working in these spaces, I don't believe just there's inherent power in me being a black person in these spaces because I could be a black person who is trash. Uh, but I think if you're doing the work, it's different. Thank you, Sane. Um, I think that's a great uh, place to, to leave. I really want to thank uh, Sane, Adrian, and Andrew for sharing their scarce time to bring some learnings to us. Um, you'll, you, you, you've read their bios, uh, making the future students and other students, uh, you, you've read their Twitter feeds, you've read about them. Um, and so you can only get a sense of the number of, uh, pressures and the sense of, uh, the, the fiber, um, and sense of commitment it takes to do this work on an ongoing basis, um, uh, and to lean into challenges and to lean into problems. Um, so I really want to thank you and want to take the learnings that you're uh, giving to us very seriously and hoping that we can arm ourselves with those learnings in our work at the Ryerson Leadership Lab, making the future students and other students who have joined us today uh, are, as Andrew said, not the future change makers, they are the present change makers. And uh, there are huge opportunities in this class and in the sprinkles of wisdom uh, that you have left all over the place in this last 45 minutes for us to take up some of the uh, some of the issues and uh, and activate on them with with knowledge and forbearance so thanks to all of you <laughs>